we are um, just so thrilled that Naomi Blum is here to kick off our demonstration Global Math Stories session for our very first bilingual Global Math Stories conference about exploring the world with math. And um, excuse me if I pause, I'm letting people in um, as I talk. So um, Naomi, just a little bit about Naomi. Naomi is a former middle school science teacher who has led professional development for math educators. She was the former education engagement manager at MathKind, and she currently works with Life Hikes, which is a communication and executive training company. She is passionate in her belief that humankind can build, mend, and strengthen society through stories. She has been a regular blood donor for 12 years as a way to give tangible, immediate help to people in her community. And in her spare time, Naomi enjoys walking in the woods while listening to podcasts. She lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, with her two bouncy children and her even, even bouncier dog. So before we turn it over to Naomi, um, we are going to start our slides with Chad, Dr. Chad McGlone, who is one of the co-founders of MathKind just giving us an overview. The Global Math Stories is the brainchild of um, Chad's brain. And so he's gonna walk us through the first few slides of um, what MathKind is about and specifically what Global Math Stories are. So take it away, Chad. Thank you. And Jenny, you are also one of the creators of Global Math Story. We would not have even done this if you hadn't help direct some great ideas on the trip to Michigan one year. Naomi, can you advance to the next slide, please? <clears throat> I think it's happening. Maybe. Yes. There we go. All right, great. Well, so um, Global Math Stories, I mean, MathKind is an organization that really works with educators around the world, both in the US and, and around the world, sort of to help teachers, to provide teachers tools to teach differently in the mathematics classroom so that students are the center of the instruction, so that they're encouraged to be real thinkers in the classroom. And, and one way we do that is by helping them make global connections, helping teachers make global connections in the classroom. Class comes alive if I talk about goats that climb trees in Morocco or the Joglavak in Cameroon or the rabbit proof fence in Australia or the shepherd's leap, something you'll learn about and hopefully not practice um, tonight. So um, what we've done is we've created these little one page stories. They're intended for teachers to, to be able to read and be inspired by. So you, can you change to the next slide? So you see the dots, each one represents a story. Each, each story has a, a, a lot of things. I mean, there's basically one page about what life is like in different parts of the world. You'll see an example of that, really a single story expanded. Um, so that you can have lots of different entry points. Uh, the stories themselves, if you go to the website, you'll see learning activities, sometimes full lessons, for sure some basic questions about mathematics that you might find in the story or that might be related to it. In addition to that, there are social justice questions, things that will really challenge children to think deeply, even adults, to be honest. Um, and then finally, there are some pr slide presentations. For instance, the slide presentation you'll see tonight almost certainly will be connected to one of the stories. And when you're teaching your class, you can choose the slides that work for the lesson that you're teaching. Naomi's going to spend an, you know, an hour talking about um, the shepherd's leap. You're not going to spend an hour in the class so that you can do a math activity. You might choose only five slides just to set the scene and also motivate the students to do some more work on their own. So with that, I'm going to let Naomi teach us all a lot more about the Canary Islands. Thanks, Chad and Jenny. One of the benefits that I love doing, now I have two big screens here. I want this to be interactive. You can use the chat. I will try to answer questions on the spot. 
no problem if you want to raise your hand. I want this to be interactive because stories come alive when people are taking an active role in this. In the classroom, as well as any presentation, any meeting, people aren't really there until you ask them to participate. If I can do a quick body poll, what do you already know about Global Mass Stories? Zero means I just kind of logged in right now and I'm not sure. 10 is I've already written my own Global Mass Story. So I'm gonna ask Jenny to read our poll here. When I say go, hold up your fingers. What do you already know about Global Mass Stories? Ready, go. Jenny, what do we have here? We have a little bit of everything, <laughs> but we have some definite, some definite newbies, which is fabulous. It is great to have newbies. Yeah. And this is a technique you can use in your classroom to start off any, any lesson, but especially a global math story because it pulls people in. And especially if you're ever virtual, if you ask them to hold up their hands, what else can they not be holding in their hands? <laughs> their phones. They have to turn on their camera and they have to actively engage. Before we start with the Canary Islands, I'm gonna point out some general overview questions that I have peppered throughout the presentation that you can also use to spark a connection of where you can go with these. First is notice and wonder. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you have questions about? Estimation and optimization. You can ask how much, what's the extent of it? How much do you think it would cost? What's the shortest distance? What other routes can you take? Similar and different. This is my personal favorite because anytime you are finding something that is similar and something that is different, your brain is automatically making these connections with something you already know. What do they have in common? Which one doesn't belong? Remember from the old Sesame Street, which one of these things doesn't belong? And what other strategies? And where have you seen that before? The last one is math and social justice, which is part of the core of math kind, where, thanks Susan and Heather, where can you incorporate the social connection, connection and the justice connection? I gotta move you all over here to read. Okay, what other decisions can be made and what consequences does each decision have and what can you do with? Now we will get, into the Canary Islands and the Shepherd's Leap. I will ask either you can come off mute or put it in the chat. Has anyone ever been to the Canary Islands? Nobody has been. One of my first, and Chad and Jenny were joking about this before we logged on, is my name is now synonymous with a rabbit hole. Every time I start researching these global math stories, I fall down a rabbit hole. And I will tell you with every single one, and you can do this too, one of my first stops is Airbnb and I check out all the places that I might be able to go if somehow something comes together and I'm able to travel. So I already have a wish list of Airbnbs in the Canary Islands that I want to go. I also think... Who else might I know who would know anything about the Canary Islands? Right now, Life Hikes, my current company, it's a global company. I put on our company intranet, hey, I'm doing a volunteer demo math lesson on the Canary Islands. Has anyone been? Do you have any pictures? Three people. One who is getting ready to leave for a vacation to the Canary Islands five days after I posted. And 
for me, it just brings these things together. It takes the globe and shrinks it. And I can have a handle on, I know Paul was stargazing in Tenerife and you will see his picture later on. And it just brings more color to it. I think of the world, not only in a map, but in points of light and the more connections I can make between the points, the more color and the more it solidifies in what I do. We always start with a world map to kind of orient where we are. So we have here the general world map and here are the canaries and where do you live in relation to the Canary Islands? I know where I'm in Chapel Hill, which is about here. Where are you dialing in from? I know Susan, you're in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, that's a fun pun. Where is everybody else? Pennsylvania, perfect. Oh! Hey, another North Carolina and New Mexico and another North Carolina, excellent. Oh, and we have Ecuador. So Kelly from Ecuador and Colombia, excellent. These are, if you look, how would you get to the Canary Islands from where you are? Is it close? Is it far? Would you take a plane? Could you take a boat? How far do you think it would be? The other point, is right here in red. The Canary Islands are actually part of Spain. Where are the islands in relation to the main part of Spain? They are quite a distance. And uh -oh, here, similar and different, can you think of another country that has a territory far away from its mainland? When I first, uh, the Canary Islands are part of Spain, but they're so far away. And then I thought Ecuador, the US, Hawaii and Alaska are part of the United States, but nowhere near the main part of the United States. So that's another similarity that helps draw that connection in my, Argentina to UK. Kimberly, tell me more. Are you saying how you would get there first, you would fly to the UK or? If you want to share in the chat, or you can come off mute. That's okay. You can put it in later. I might have misunderstood something. Okay. The canaries are, oh, one, one segment. The canaries are an archipelago made up of eight main islands. And based on the location, where do you think the climate? Ecuador and the Galapagos. Excellent, not too far, not so close. Also, Cali. If you think where this was in the world map, what could you guess about the climate? You can ask your students, would there be snow? Could you go surfing? Could you go skiing? All of these questions you can find out and depending on the age group where you are, the questions can be tailored based on, on level. Another estimation and op estimating and optimization, which island has the largest area? Which island has the smallest area? And there we go. Okay. The landscape has deep valleys and steep ravines. Farmers have to work with the land to find innovative ways to grow crops. Countrysides like these allow farmers to grow vines. The bowls help keep the high trade winds from damaging the crops and they hold in the heat. When I look at this picture, I immediately wondered, okay, how, what shapes are there? What questions? My question was, how in the world did that even happen? And are these natural? Are they man-made? I see the circles and I'm not sure. What do you think the scale is? What could fit in one of the bowls? If I can find a person, would a person 
be where would the person fit in this in this picture something how many are there how much area thank you yes susan absolutely and for teachers who are not bound by the same copyright restrictions as we are this will be a lot easier if you ever wanted to take a deep dive and find pictures make sure to always check what the copyright laws are you might have more latitude if you're an educator if you're an educator and it just makes preparing for these a little bit easier I always love to give a timeline, a basic history of where this lands as far as human history. In about 1000 BC, the African settlers arrived. It's believed that they're related to the Berber people. They actually traced genetics back and found there was a genetic link between the Berber people. And incidentally, I will also be pointing this out. The Berber people are discussed in the Morocco global mass story as well. And they are the indigenous people and they were the Gaunches. My pronunciation, I will apologize. I always do. I will not get it right. And I mean, no disrespect. I am just terrible. I have no ear. Then in about 100, Plutarch and I, Ptolemy, they were Roman writers and they give credit to King Juba II as having discovered the islands. 1402 now begins the Castilian co uh, colonization. Spain conquered the islands and it was brutal and it was violent because the indigenous people fought back. Between this, you have La Palma, which is the volcano and it's the earliest recorded volcano eruption on the islands, which will come into play later in the story. This part with the enslaved people was fascinating. And this is why you always, and I tell my children who are 13 and 16, you always have to check multiple sources and you always want to make sure you are providing a, as full a picture as you can. Needing a large lab, uh, labor force, the Spanish not only enslaved the indigenous population, since it was located close to Africa, they forced people from North Africa into slavery. This instance later set the stage for the transatlantic slave trade that went throughout the world. It's Christopher Columbus actually stopped at the Canary Islands on his way before he went to the Americas. This was the last stop in the ocean before he continued on. It played a role in the Spanish-American War because remember, the Canaries are part of Spain. The Spanish fortified the Canaries in case there was an attack. It never happened, but they prepared. Then in the 1800s and 1900s, there were mass departures due to the competition from the Caribbean islands, the sugar industry, which is one of their main industries, it suffered and a lot of the native Canary Islanders migrated to the Americas. They were instrumental in some Texas communities and New Orleans and Cuba and I think Venezuela was the one of the other ones. Here's the big question that always got, how did the Canary Islands get their name? If I, what is the first image that pops into your head? Yes, the canary bird, absolutely. The canary bird is actually named after the islands. It is not the other way around. There's a, I couldn't even include this in one of my rabbit holes because it really took me down deep. There's a fascinating story behind 
canary bird breeding that has to do with the English nobility and the upper class who wanted songbirds to keep as pets. Take yourself down a rabbit hole for that one. It is very fascinating, but I couldn't include it or we would be here for three hours, which I wouldn't mind. But it's actually from Latin, meaning island of the dogs. It's believed because again, there are conflicting reports and theories with what actually happened. According to Pliny the Elder, the main island had a large population of very big dogs. And this was the line in almost all of the sources that I checked until I found one that the dogs might not have been these big canines, but they were sea dogs, which were giant seals. And it all rolls into which one, I love throwing all the opportunities and all the possibilities. And you can see that a history and the people, it's not just static, it's not just one thing. There are lots of influences that come. Do you know how to whistle? Who knows how to whistle? I will refrain from the Marilyn Monroe. Okay. Why do people, no, I, I am really not good at whistling at all. Whistling is meant to mimic speech sounds and pitches. Why would somebody whistle? You can put in your, in the chat, what are, why do people whistle? What are the, what's the purpose? Yes. Oh, these are fabulous answers and all right to get somebody's attention. You want to signal something important. Make music. It's actually when I looked up whistling, it's one of the top rated irritating habits <laughs> that somebody you can listen. There's a whistling competition somewhere in North America that I shut down due to the pandemic. Sometimes people do it as a distraction. The old whistle while you work, it is an actual, that's an actual thing to kind of distract yourself while you're getting things done. Silbo Gomero. The Gaunches, the indigenous people, they developed an entire language based on whistling. And another connection that you can make is the Peru story for the Incas. Their language was another interesting, not what you would consider a typical language with oral and written history. After the Spanish arrived, there was a distinct influence as the language evolved. There are two distinct whistles that replace vowels and four whistles to replace consonants. Again, copyright, I'm limited. There are videos that you can watch of how these whistles and where they, it's very distinctive in, in how they construct it. Math for social justice, how does language evolve? Can you think of other examples of a language that has evolved? Okay. Silbo Gomero is classified by UNESCO as an intangible heritage, and it's the only fully developed whistling language practiced by about 22,000 people. It's been handed down generation to generation for thousands of years. To preserve the culture, Silbo Gomero has been taught in schools in the Canary Islands since 1999. How, why is it important to preserve whistling? How many people know Silbo Gomero compared to English, compared to Spanish? We go into the goats. The native goat breed originated in the Fuerteventura Island and in prehistoric, pre-Hispanic times, the island was named, however you pronounce this maxerata, which I know is not correct. 
They're primarily bred for their milk and used in dairy to make cheese. The special flower cheese is only found in the Canary Islands. It, let me move you all again. It's made from goat's milk and the unique flavor comes from goats grazing on the cardoon flower, which is stunningly beautiful. When I looked at it, it reminded me of something you might see in the coral reef, something underwater. And because this flower only grows in the canaries and the goats roam and graze on it, it provides a very unique cheese. I actually went on another rabbit hole to see if I could find this flower cheese anywhere at my local cheese selling locations and I was unsuccessful. That's another thing. If I go to the Canary Islands, I'm going to try some flower cheese. Goats are able to roam free and graze. When you look at this picture, can you even see the goats? They are barely scattered. And again, when you think of math and scale, where was this pic picture taken? Where are the goats in relation? Goats are extremely agile animals. They can easily scale rugged terrain. When hungry goats lose their way, shepherds must conquer 30 foot cliffs, hurdle groves of cacti or vault deep pits to retrieve them. This is a direct connection to a global mass story from Morocco, which also has the Berber people that I mentioned who found their way to the Canary Islands. And it talks about the goat's agility and climbing abilities. And that one is a favorite story of mine. I won't give you too much. You will have to go investigate it for yourselves. Distance and rugged terrain. The shepherds developed a method that allows them to travel across the land and still maneuver the uneven surfaces and boulders. How would you do it? This is something I love in the Global Mass Story is I throw it out to the kids. How would you do it? And the things they come up with are fascinating because their minds are in a completely different developmental space and they will think of out of this world ideas. The tool they use and first before showing them everything, anytime you're doing a presentation, you only want people to see what you want them to see first. And it's kind of you guide and only show them parts of the puzzle one at a time. I start off, the tool they use is called a lanza or a garrote. Again, the name depends on where in the Canary Islands they are using it. They're actually two different names. It's a wooden staff ranging in length from six to 12 feet, depending on the height of the owner. The main shaft, El Palo, is generally made from Canary pine. The top end is wider than the bottom which terminates in a sharp pyramid-shaped metal point, El Ragaton. The length of the metal maintains a direct relationship with the length of the stick. So already in your mind, do you have any idea of what this might look like? And you can ask your students, maybe have them draw a picture before you show them more. What do you think it looks like? And a direct relationship between the length of the wooden part and the length of the metal. Notice and wonder what other shapes come to mind and what questions do you have? Now I show them the thing, but I don't show them how they use it. I just show them an actual picture of what it was. And I have to move you all again. And I ask, is this what you had in your mind? And again, you can do the similar and different. If it's different, how is it different? If it's the same, oh no, okay, hold on. Oh, there we go. 
notice and wonder, how does it picture with what you thought and how do you think it's used by the shepherds? You can do the extension math problems where you can talk, okay, if the El Palo is, if El Palo is six feet and El Regaton is 20 inches, what's the ratio of wood to metal? If El Palo needs to be seven feet, how long would El Regaton be? And these are questions that you can extend either after the lesson, as part of the lesson, in addition, a different lesson. Then we show them this. And now as you build up to it, you are not only showing them what you have. Oh, goodbye, Andrea, if you have to leave. Catch the recording. They now have their own ideas before showing what they use because humans around the world are fascinating. And it's amazing how a lot come up with similar ideas. And another podcast that I was listening to while walking in the woods talks about a concept where humans who develop a way in different cultures have different ideas and inventions. If you go back to the Incas with the global mass story, the Incas, they made Machu Picchu, they didn't have a wheel. They developed and their civilization and their culture developed, they didn't have the concept of a wheel when they made Machu Picchu. And then you look at these pictures, where do you see the math automatically? Does anybody wanna throw in just because I love other perspectives. I saw one thing immediately, but maybe you see something different. Yes, Carrie, yes, absolutely. I saw the angles and the distance, Kimberly, absolutely. In this lesson, you can talk about measuring angles, obtuse angles, acute angles. If you have older students and you talk about force, velocity, inertia, you can do so much math with how much energy it would take. If you launch from different spots, you can again, tumble and make this into whatever it is that, that you need. This tradition was passed down from generation to generation. It started waning, but it was revived. And now it's also used to attract tourists who want to try. Again, there's some really interesting pictures that if you are not bound by copyright, you can definitely include. They are really interesting. In addition to herding sheep, sometimes it was used in combat over territory, which some of your students might point out as soon as somebody hears about a sharp metal point, they will say, ooh, I bet you could nail somebody with that one. Pole vaulting, absolutely pole vaulting. That was another thing that I came up with and you can complement and, and use those together. And if you're ever teaching when they have the Summer Olympics, it's another fun connection to can bring world events into your classroom. The Global Mass Story from Sri Lanka discover, uh, discusses preserving culture by allowing tourists to share in the experience. And from a social justice question, it's a very important question to ask. When you invite tourists to do something, are you somehow taking away from the culture? Are you exposing new people to the culture? Are you providing revenue as people who inhabit the land and natively this is part of their culture? And these are all fabulous questions to, to bring up and consider. Tourism, a large portion of the economy is based on revenue from visitors. Each island is unique in look, feel, and culture. Tenerife Island is the most visited island in the Canaries. Five million people come each year. This is pre-pandemic, obviously. This lower picture is the pyramids 
I will not attempt that one. And you can say, what does that remind you of? If you look at the Inca story and you think, oh, I see heads nodding, that you were thinking something very similar, that how did they build it? How are they, how are these rocks placed? Because they're they don't use mortar. In Machu Picchu, those stones are perfectly aligned, so there's no mortar involved. Mount this very tall mountain <laughs> with the highest elevation in Spain, with it's almost tw uh, 12,198 feet. Another connection, there is an entire global mass story from Venezuela about a cable car. And again, the more you can use these stories, you can, yes, Pythagorean theorem with triples and right angles, absolutely, Chad. And when you can use a math story and you talk about Venezuela, you can start, hey, does this remind you of anything? Does anybody remember another global math story that might've had a cable car? And again, the more times you can point and put connections in the little spider graph of people's brains, the more meaningful and the more memorable it will become. Here's my friend, Paul, stargazing on Tenerife. He is a amateur slash semi-professional photographer. And this picture doesn't, he said it doesn't even do it justice. Again, I have a wish list on Airbnb <laughs> to go visit these. Okay, Lanzarote Island. This Piñas del Chache is that island's highest mountain peak with an elevation of almost 2,220 feet. How does that compare to the other one with the cable car? How does that compare to where you are located? Where do you live? What is the highest peak? A lot of us are in North Carolina. I was just in Boone last weekend and we were up in the mountains. I used to live in Miami, no mountains. The more you can bring people in and have them compare, the more meaning you can create. This is another one I wanna to go to. It boasts the world's most dangerous barbecue according to a Daily Mail article. El Diablo restaurant cooks its food using geothermal heat from a 3,333 feet in Boone, excellent. The, they cook food on a geothermal heat from a volcano and the oven reaches temperatures of 840 degrees Fahrenheit. First, you can ask how many skewers are there? How many on each skewer? And they can multiply from there. Then you can, and this also gets into social justice. How many people could that feed? And how might that answer change depending on where you were? I honed in right away on how hot is 840 degrees? And I had to think about it, okay? How, what's the boiling temperature of water? 212. What's the temperature for baking cookies? When my daughter makes them, she's usually somewhere at 375. What about a kiln for ceramics? That one's in the thousands, I believe. And then here is your cooking food on 840. Agriculture, some islands get very little rain. So inhabitants have developed farming practices to work with the land. They use the ravines to block harsh winds and control sunlight. They use a volcanic derived mulch that keeps in moisture. And again, if you think back to the beginning with all those bowls in the slides, that's where they use for protecting from the wind. Wet areas of the islands grow bananas and sugarcane. If you think back to the history of sugarcane, once the Caribbean islands and their sugar production, it also impacted the Canary Islands and they're great on tomatoes. When I first saw this picture, I asked Jenny if it was upside down. 
Does it look upside down to anybody else? I would have thought that the bananas would all be hanging down, but she assured me this is accurate and it looks to me like they're upside down. And I open it up to the other students. What does this look like to you? Dry areas, and you can see again in the bowls and they have these as barriers. They have the rock, the building of the, the boulders. Almonds, figs, wine grapes. Here's where the volcano comes back into the picture. In September of 2021, La Palma, volcano erupted. This satellite image of the volcano was taken on October 10th, 2021. Spain did not officially declare the eruption finished until December 25th, 2021. So first you can look at the picture and ask how far did the lava flow? How much was affected? What do you think? And the biggie is what else was happening in the world. This was during the pandemic. I don't even remember hearing about this because everything was, so in the middle of a global pandemic where you already have tourism taking a hit, then you have this volcano. And if you look at pictures, it is unbelievable the destruction that this volcano caused. How would this affect residents? What are the ramifications? If you think about how the Canary Islands were formed, they're formed from volcanic eruptions, just like Hawaii. And what does this do to change the landscape? Every time a volcano erupts, what does it do to change the landscape? I actually visited Mount St. Helens in Portland and this is how they grow. It's very curious. Really? Sarah, you're saying that in Tonga, didn't they have a community spread case of COVID until they didn't have one until after the eruption? If I would I, love I, to hear more yeah, about if I that. remember correctly, the, the community spread cases came in with the um, wow rescue ships that were bringing rescue. food and replacing the cables and Wow. There were a couple of there are a number of Pacific islands that just locked down and had no community spread because nobody came and nobody left. That is, and this is why I love Global Math Stories because somebody will come in with a tidbit or a question that recenters the whole discussion. I absolutely love it. This was the end and I can't believe it's even the end because I could just keep going and I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see everybody again. Callie with a two, oh yes, there was a tsunami recording with the eruption in Tonga. Callie, you had to evacuate for a few hours. That's interesting. And that in another global mass story with the Maldives deals with a tsunami and the effects. It's all coming together, all these little pieces of the puzzle. And these, in the website for MathKind, a lot of the stories, some of them will have these fleshed out presentations. Some of them have the, the one page and I encourage anybody to fall down a rabbit hole and the more connections as Chad and Jenny and Callie know, it's fascinating that I would teach math education to math teachers. Anybody who knows me when I first joined MathKind and told them and they said, you are teaching math because I count on my fingers. If I would have had the opportunity to learn math using these innovative methods with this type of application, who knows where I would be. I depend on my 13 year old son to calculate things for me. I scream down the stairs and ask him questions. He actually helped me out with the ratio 
for the Lonza when I said, I asked him, what's the, what's the ratio? If I measured on my computer screen that the wooden part was four inches and the metal part was this many inches, how does that translate into feet? And he just in two seconds spit an answer back. Math is definitely more than computation. Absolutely, Sarah, definitely. I don't know if you have any questions for me in particular, but Chad and Jenny and Callie can absolutely answer any other math kind specific questions. I would love to open it up if anybody had other ideas. Can I say, um, you know, what I love about this lesson and being here is you can, you were learning so much about the Canary Islands. And then if I were teaching it, I would probably just choose a small section or I would speed through several of them. And um, one thing we'll learn tomorrow is to how to take this story or any story and, and we really do any math lesson. So when Naomi started talking about the food, now we have recipes we could talk about, um, or you can, we, there's integers, right? And it it's really is, you choose the topic based on what you're teaching and then the support story can support that. That's one we'll, thing we'll talk about, but Naomi sort of sets the stage here with this great PowerPoint presentation. You, if anybody has any questions, you can come off mute, you can put it in the chat. Otherwise, other than drooling over the landscape in the Canary Islands, there's the possibilities are endless because math, the more I learned about it and the more that Chad and Callie taught me the more I wish I really would have learned math in an entirely different way. It was very much just pounded where I could do long division because I remember, okay, you put the thing here and here's the house and then you do this, but I had no idea what I was doing. If you asked me to explain it, I couldn't explain it. And now it, it doesn't have to be like that. And stories bring everything alive. I would love to take this opportunity to just put in a plug too for another way to use the Global Math Stories, which is yes, as a vehicle for teaching math, but also as a concept for engaging your students to write one, to explore, to pick out a place in the world anywhere. We have we have a whole wish list that, um, gosh, if we had the time, we would love to write about this or that because the world is so fascinating. Um, we have a few stories on the site that have been sent to us by teachers, by their students. Sometimes they're written by the students. Sometimes the teacher helps. Um, but that's also, you know, always an open invitation. And there are so many places on our website where we're have a, a link to a suggestion form. It doesn't have to be a whole constructed story. It can be, what are some questions that you thought of? What is an activity? You know, when Chad goes into the schools and teaches um, models some lessons, he'll, he'll come up with some really, you know, come home saying, gosh, we were doing the, the Bajau story in the Philippines about the people who live on the water. And the teacher said, well, you know, instead of just um, calculating how big a boat would be if it was this size, I'm going to have my students arrange their desk in the size of a, of a boat and live in this space all day to have an experience of what that would be like. So we just, we love, we, we love hearing um, how these can be useful and would love to put up on the website anything that you all would send us. Can, can, I, can I add? Even, oh, I'm sorry, Chad. Yeah, can I want to add to what Jenny was saying? Because um, I did a workshop once and um, a teacher, sort of a, a, a white sort of, you know, waspy teacher stood up and said, I wish I had a culture, you know, when talking about culture and mathematics, and we all do. And um, there are two stories on our website in particular about just people growing up or life in um, the United States. I wrote a story about my hometown in uh, Marysville, Ohio. And then another author wrote a story in Alabama about think something he did was fascinating to read um, as a child. And so truly, 
making a global connection truly could be you writing about your hometown and something special about it. I love that. And you can even, this doesn't, the vehicle for the global math stories, even though it's rooted in math to prompt, this is cross-curricular. Depending on, if you're in elementary school, you can have this one vehicle and spoke off in all these different subjects. If you are in middle school or high school, you can coordinate and collaborate with other teachers and continue using it uh, across different content because it just naturally lends itself to so many different subject areas. I'll say one of my favorite things about doing global math stories with students is that as they uncover the math in people in other people's lives and worlds, they begin to develop this belief that everyone does math all of the time and that math is everywhere. And as they begin to believe that about other people, they also begin to realize like, oh, then I must too. Um, and so I think it's really, really cool. And if you come to the keynote um, later this week with Dr. Shelley Jones, she'll speak a little bit more about this, but as students are, um, for example, the, the Venezuela cable car story that Naomi mentioned, we had some students here in Guayaquil do that story while a cable car was being built. And so they were able to see something happening in another country and uncover all of the math in that, but then also connect it to their own lives. And so they're also building their identity as, as being a math person and being capable of, of doing math. So. Um, that to me that's one of the really powerful things is they're like finding it everywhere and then beginning to see it in themselves and in their lives as well. I think we might be finished. Yeah, unless there's anything, any more comments or questions. Um, I don't want to keep you all because we're going to hold you captive again tomorrow and the, the day after. Um, just to, yeah, Chad, do you want to say a little bit about, for the folks who weren't at the beginning, a little bit about um, what you're planning for tomorrow? Yeah, for tomorrow, what, what I want to do is just sort of use today as a, as a jumping off point and to dig into the stories a little bit more, to have people maybe choose a story that's interesting to you and then to talk about how to just make, make that connection. If I'm teaching fractions, how can I turn the story that you've chosen into a fraction story? We have lessons that are written for a fractions lesson, but I think that could be done with any story. Same for integers. I used a rabbit proof fence to teach integers because there's a city near where the rabbit proof fence is and you build buildings that have above ground and below ground spaces. So there we go, we could do integers. Um, and, and we wanna talk about how we could do that and to hear your questions. You know, how can I make this how can you make this happen easily in your classroom or help others to do so? So that's what tomorrow will be about. Well, thank you all so much. And um, just so grateful, so grateful that you all are here and interested in this. Thank you, Naomi, for walking us through a fascinating story. I've got to taste flour cheese before I die. That is like now. <laughs> Yes. It's also dinner time, so I'm a little hungry, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was so fun, and it was great to see you all, and we hope to see you again tomorrow night. All right. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.